We're very excited to have uh, some great speakers today. I'm going to introduce the person that's going to introduce the, the big star. So we have two stars here today. I'm Cindy Williams. I don't know if I've met all of you. I'm the Acting Director of Education now at Hillcrease, so I took Deborah Burke's place. She has some big shoes to follow, so uh, I'm working on that. But today I'd like to introduce uh, Alana Newman. She is the um, um, McFarland Professor of Psychology and the Co-Director of Titan. And she'll explain that to you, and she will be the one uh, talking, uh, introducing Dr. Lisa Byers from all of you for us today. Thank you. And you're very lucky to have uh, Cindy at the, at the realm here um, for Gilcrease. Uh, my name is Alana Newman, and I'm one of the co-directors of the University of Tulsa Institute of Trauma, Adversity, and Injustice. Uh, two of the other co-directors are here, and a few are sneaking in uh, because they're in the middle of teaching, so they're going to come late. Dr. Joanne Davis, um, Professor Kathleen Stern. And Titan is an interdisciplinary research institute that engages scholars, scientists, professionals, and students to create foundational knowledge about trauma and adversity from very, very diverse perspectives. And we're just delighted to partner with Gilcrease Museum for today's program, and we're also going to do a program on the 19th of March, uh, responding to Rick Bartow's exhibit, Things You Know But Cannot Explain. As many of you in the room know, this exhibit uh, depicts many personal experiences of loss and pain, cultural engagement in global myths, especially Native American transformation stories. Those are the heart of Bartow's work and art. Uh, you may not be aware that he's also a Vietnam War veteran, and his art really in many ways speaks to issues of PTSD, of trauma, of historical trauma, both directly and indirectly. You may know that some of the paintings are, one of the paintings is named PTSD. There's a painting called Anxiety. Uh, there's a lot of work also on nightmares. So in that spirit, we hope to dialogue now and on March 19th about how we can think about art and expand our knowledge about trauma thinking about this exhibit. Therefore, in that spirit, I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Lisa Byers, who's Associate Professor at the University of Oklahoma, Tulsa, uh, and the Henry Zarrow School of Social Work. She's also an uh, affiliate of OU's Native American Studies program. And she received her PhD in social work from Washington University's George Lauren Brown School of Social Work, which is one of the best social work schools in the country. Uh, and she was the first American Indian to attain a doctorate there. After receiving her doctorate, she served as a postdoctoral fellow with the National Institute of Mental Health and that's a really big deal as well. And she was Minority Research Fellow with the Council for Social Work Education. Since coming to the University of um, Oklahoma, she's created the first graduate certificate in social work with American Indians, and she's also developed the Council of Social Work Education's graduate curriculum regarding American Indians. This is very, very important work in terms of culturally relevant therapy. She's both examined and taught about child welfare, historical trauma, which we're going to hear a lot about today, and mental health disparities in tribal communities. She's also studied what we would call uh, American Indian grand families, families in which grandparents are raising their grandchildren. And that's how I first came across her work. Currently, she's working on a study of service providers to American Indians dealing with the trauma of se child sexual commercial exploitation. And sex trafficking is a big problem in Tulsa. So today, her talk today, in that spirit of starting to think about trauma and its relationship to art, we're very, very excited for her to give her talk, Is a Culture of PTSD or Historical Trauma? Dr. Byers will discuss Native American orientations to wellness and the latest understanding of the connection between historical trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. And building on Bartow's use of art as a tool for healing, she will address pathways to healing across cultures. So we're very excited about this dialogue, and we're thrilled you're here. Let's see if I can get, ooh, it is working. I hear the echo. Thank you very much for that introduction. That was a little uncomfortable. I sound better on paper. <laughs> Um, I'm very delighted to be here today. Um, 
excited for the work that uh, your center is doing and particularly excited for the, the collaboration across universities. That is very exciting to me. Um, we're going to start today. Can everybody hear me well? Okay. Always what I do before I begin is talk about the honor of service. I don't know if you can see that as well as you might be able to with the background, but that's what it says. And I always center every presentation I do uh, with this slide, noting that before we begin our service to American Indian Alaska Natives, we have to think not only of the individual, but the child, the family, the clan, the tribe. So that reinforces that collective orientation that defines us as Native people. When you introduce yourself in tribal contexts, those of you who, who do that and are a tribal member and culturally connected know that that's one of the first things people want to know. Who are your people? What is your clan? Who is your family? You don't go and say, I'm a social worker. Um, it's the family. It's that communal identity that's prominent. And then I tell my students, once we have that honor in our mind and our heart, also reinforcing that it's not just our cognitions, it's not just our mind, it's not just our intelligence, there's also wisdom of the heart, and you have to make the pathways back and forth. One doesn't rule the other. So once we have that honor, we can serve with respect for the struggle, and we'll talk a lot about that today, the immense struggles that tribal people have endured, and then also the strengths that come from that struggle. So it's a balance of both of those. And then truly it is a celebration because there's beauty and power that's within the continuance of tribal cultures. I firmly believe there is much wisdom. And if things hadn't turned out the way they did, that there might have been a more immediate access to a lot of that wisdom for healing. And I'm very grateful for the period of time that I'm in and the fact that I'm older and can see changes and differences because I'm seeing research open up, neuroscience studies opening up to know a lot of what we knew, a lot of that wisdom that was there, the impact of meditation, all of those elements. So I'm seeing a door that's opening wider and is connecting with the wisdom that's been inherent in those tribal cultures. And then in terms of the art that is here for us, and so I want to take that same honor and offer it to Mr. Rick Bartow, his service, his journey upon coming back home, and the healing path he is offering us today and throughout the exhibit. Because he does represent that respect through his art for the struggle and strengths of him as a tribal person, of his Northern California tribe. And I feel connected through that art and as a tribal person, and it's through that art that I see that celebration, that beauty, power, and that story in his individual work that collective story. Now, this is how I teach my section on historical trauma. And people, you know, get the confused dog head cocked to the side because they think that what is this relevance of having a story on American Indians, a course on American Indians beginning with this book. And what I do is I have the book with me and I pass it around to the students, and each person will read a page of that story. And so it passes around the room, and I feel it gives an opportunity for a stronger memory of that story, because you're speaking the words, you're seeing the pictures, and you're hearing the story. More so than if I put up statistics, <coughs> graphs, research related to historical trauma. How many people are familiar with Henry's? Okay. I'll go ahead and pass this around, but given I've got the microphone, I'll go ahead and read it myself. And this will take about 10 minutes. Henry Brown wasn't sure how old he was, and Henry was a slave. And slaves weren't allowed to know their birthdays. Henry and his brothers and sisters worked in the big house where the master lived. Henry's master had been good to Henry and his family. But Henry's mother knew things could change. 
Do you see those leaves blowing in the wind? They're torn from the trees like slave children are torn from their families. One morning, the master called for Henry and his mother, and they climbed the wide staircase. The master lay in bed with only his head above the cloak. He was very ill. He beckoned them to come closer. Some slaves were freed by their owners. Henry's heart beat fast. Maybe the master would set him free. But the master said, You're a good worker, Henry. I'm giving you my son. You must obey him and never tell a lie. Henry nodded, but he didn't say thank you. That would have been a lie. Later that day, Henry watched a bird soar high above the trees. Free bird, happy bird, Henry thought. Henry said goodbye to his family. He looked across the field. The leaves swirled in the wind. Henry worked in his new master's factory. He was good at his job. Do not tear that tobacco leaf, the boss yelled at the new boy. He poked the boy with a stick. If you made a mistake, the boss would beat you. Henry was lonely. One day he met Nancy, who was shopping for her mistress. They walked and talked and agreed to meet again. Henry felt like singing, but slaves didn't dare sing in the streets. Instead, he hummed all the way home. Months later, Henry asked Nancy to be his wife. When both their masters agreed, Henry and Nancy were married. Soon there was a little baby, and then another and another. Henry knew they were very lucky. <coughs> They lived together even though they had different masters. But Nancy was worried. I'm afraid we will sell our children. Her master had lost a great deal of money. Henry sat very still. Henry worked hard all morning. He tried to forget what Nancy had said. His friend James came into the factory. He whispered to Henry, Your wife and children were just sold at the slave market. No, cried Henry. Henry couldn't move. He couldn't think. He couldn't work. Twist that tobacco, the boss poked Henry. Henry twisted tobacco leaves, his heart twisted in his chest. At lunchtime, Henry rushed to the center of town. A large group of slaves were tied together. The owner shouted at them. Henry looked for his family. Father, father! Henry watched his children disappear down the road. Where was Nancy? He saw her the moment she saw him. When he wiped away his tears, Nancy, too, was gone. Henry no longer sang. He couldn't hum. He went to work, and at night he ate supper and went to bed. Henry tried to think of happy times, but all he could see was carts carrying away everyone he loved. Henry knew he would never see his family again. Many weeks passed. One morning, Henry heard singing. A little bird flew out of a tree into the open sky, and Henry thought about being free. But how? As he lifted a crate, he knew the answer. He asked James and Dr. Smith to help him. Dr. Smith was a white man who thought slavery was wrong. They met early the next day at an empty warehouse. Henry arrived with a box. I will mail myself to a place where there are no slaves, he said. James stared at the box, then at Henry. What if you cough and someone hears you? I will cover my mouth and hope. Dr. Smith wrote on the box, to William H. Johnson, Arch Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Henry would be delivered to friends in Philadelphia. Then he printed on the crate in big letters, This side up with care. Henry needed an excuse to stay home, or the work boss would think he had run off. James pointed to Henry's sore finger, but Henry knew it wasn't bad enough. He opened a bottle of oil of vitriol. No, cried James. Henry poured it on his hand. It burned his skin to the bone. Now the boss would have to let him stay home. Dr. Smith bandaged Henry's pan. They arranged to meet the next morning at 4 o'clock. Oh. Sorry, I oh, The sun was not yet up when Henry climbed into the box. Ready, he said. James nailed down the lid. Dr. Smith and James drove to the station. The railway clerk tipped the box over and nailed, it, and nailed the paper to the bottom. Dr. Smith begged the clerks to be careful that they didn't listen. They threw the box into the baggage car. Hours passed. Henry was lifted up and thrown again, upside down. He heard waves splashing. This must be the steamboat headed for D.C. The ship rode smoothly, but Henry was still upside down, and blood rushed to his head. His face got hot. His eyes ached. He thought his head would burst. But he was afraid to move. Someone might hear him. I'm tired of standing, someone said. Why don't we move that box and sit on us, said another. Henry held his breath. 
Could they be talking about his box? Henry was pushed. The box scraped the deck. Now he was on his right side. Now on his left. And suddenly right side up. What do you think is in here, said the first man. Well, I guess, said the other. I am now, thought Henry, but not the kind they imagined. Henry was carried off the steamboat and placed in a railroad car. This time, head up, and fell asleep to the rattling song of the train. He awoke to loud knocking. Henry, are you all right in there? All right, he answered. The cover was pried up. Henry stretched and stood up. Four men smiled at him. Welcome to Philadelphia. At last, Henry had a birthday, March 30th, 1849, his first day of freedom, and from that day on, he also had a middle name. Everyone called him Henry Fox Brown. And that's the end of the story. And so we read it, and then that's when I go into what are the defining elements, what part of the story is memorable, and people will talk about the loss, you know, losing your children. Imagine if your children could be taken at any point in time. And unfortunately, that's what happened to tribal children. And so we make those connections across cultures. We make connections across the oppression. And then we go into the actual definitions of historical trauma. And I have to give a lot of credit to Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart, who's done work in this area. And also, even before her work, there was work by a gentleman that referenced historical trauma as a soul wound. And he was a psychologist and spent over 20 years in practice with tribal people. And so lots of people did work before us. And as I go through the presentation, you'll see how that has moved along. And so with historical trauma, you'll see key words are cumulative, emotional, psychological wounding. Over the lifespan, not just your lifespan, but across generations, emanating from massive group trauma. And then another component is the fact that that grief is historical and it's also unresolved. So the grief response is denied, delayed, impaired. Um, American Indians' religion was not officially legal until 1978. Doesn't mean that it went away, but it certainly impaired um, some of those healing ceremonies that incorporated groups. And so I wanted to make that point that we had ways to heal, they were oppressed, and they we resisted and they remained. I have stories from my family that my grandmother said for soft dances and other things, they would go to the woods and you know really take care to hide. Um, my partner at the time uh, was white, and he had the story for his grandmother that one time they snuck and went to see a stop dance and got their tires slashed. That's <laughs> the message of don't come, don't see these things, they're private. Okay, I'm going to get into a little bit more about myself. Let me get my notes as I walk over. That's me as a baby. Oh, can I get a collective? Oh. <laughs> So here's all my professional affiliations with some pictures and then the fact that I am a member of the Cherokee tribe. Um, I know my clan affiliation through my mother, who's in the middle, and then my grandmother. That's on. I, I call this her Ella Fitzgerald book. I love her hair. I just love it. And then my daughter, Hallie, who's now 15. And then, yeah, I do want to highlight this. It's a graduate certificate in social work with American Indians. He got cut off there. I'm very excited about that. So our time here today, the rest of it, I've got three big goals for us. We want to increase our awareness of tribal cultures, traditional orientations to wellness. We want to increase knowledge of historical trauma, talk about connection to PTSD, and then also present pathways to healing across cultures. I may be unusual to you in that I talk about all of these elements of myself um, to try and reduce stigma about them. Uh, symbolic interactionism theory, I'll throw theory at you as justification, to destigmatize some of these elements that you see in these circles. As I said, I'm a tribal person. I'm a professor of social work, which means I teach. 
I supervise students in the field with some of the worst things in life that you could ever think of that people spend a lot of their time avoiding, even the existence of. So it's trying and difficult, and, and, I, and I'm weak. I'm not in practice. It's my students that are on the lines seeing day-to-day -day the trauma and intervening. And so that's the context of what I teach about. That's the context of what I work with, trauma, grandparents raising grandchildren. What I knew going in, based on personal experience, was born out in the research that the people that are seeking services at an urban clinic, the grandparents didn't make that decision in the context of good times. We had a lot of grandparents that did it out of necessity. Their children were in jail. Their children were substance abusing. They didn't know where they were. Um, some people had died. Some of their children, some of them taking over the grandchildren. And I certainly don't mean to indicate that grandparents that raise their grandkids deal with all of that, but in terms of the service users that we were talking to, a lot of trauma was in their family. And it's not as if those kids would go away. I think of a lot of the research focuses on the grandparent and the grandchild, as if that child, there's never any more contact. But there's lots of stress points, trying to get the child out of jail, or what happens when the child gets out of jail and they're wanting to come back. They have no resources. They're wanting to try and get the grandchild back. It's just a, a lot of stress that arises. And I've also done a lot of work, and so it's not that I don't advise everybody to do this, to come up and, and acknowledge that they've been diagnosed with PTSD, uh, major depression and dysphymia. Um, I don't encourage anybody, if they haven't done a lot of work and they're not in this position, uh, to destigmatize these events. If those have happened to you, it can still be a good life. Um, but so those are all the places that I'm coming from. And a very interesting story later in this presentation, you'll see where all of these came together during an ethical dilemma when we were researching adults that had gone to boarding school. I want to take the moment to emphasize the diversity among tribal people. When we say American Indian Alaska Native, that's how we're referred to in policy. Native American is still, you know, sad. Indigenous. So I'll use those interchangeably, but what I want people to recall and remember is the immense diversity that's among tribal people. I know the maps are small, but you can hopefully pick out the different colors that have the different groupings of major cultural areas from North America to South America. And then this is a picture of the United States and it lists all of the different tribes. And then we are pretty unique with the 39 tribal nations that we have here in Oklahoma. A majority of which were removed from their traditional homelands. And so we moved, tribes were moved here under very traumatic circumstances, displaced tribes that were already here. And so we do have that history, but we have the most tribal nations of any state. So some people might think, well, it's so diverse, what's the point of talking about a collective of American Indian, Alaska Native? What's the point of Native American? Well, we do have things that are shared. We have nature-based life ways. They can be expressed very diverse. Uh, many tribes, if not all, have clans. The names of those clans will vary depending on where the tribe is, what's prominent, what's special, what's meaningful to them. So there's where you'll see, ooh, that was a Oklahoma bar. There is where you'll see um, the similarities with those nature-based life ways through diverse expression. And then it's shared in resistance to U.S. domination. And there's diversity even there in terms of contact, our interaction with Europeans, and then our resistance acts. Um, so there's not one tribal language. I've often been asked, do you speak Indian? <laughs> so it's kind of funny. I'll keep pressing the wrong button. So I want to highlight uh, for that first goal, did I skip forward? No, I didn't. So what did we teach? What were the beliefs, the traditional tribal beliefs that uh, anthropologists, that fortunately now uh, Native writers have researched and referenced? 
beliefs were that there is a creator. Humans are just one small part of that universe. So if you, you can hopefully connect, if you have that mindset, what you do is viewed within a world where you're going to have impact. There's people of equal value to you. So it sets up a different decision-making process. Also with the interconnectedness of the world. Um, it's not just us. We're not just standing alone as human beings to dominate, to take over. We have to think of our actions. We have to think of the repercussions of those. And what you'll often hear is a reference to seven generations. You think of that seven generations ahead of you. Long term, what will this impact be? In terms of the values, collectivism, acceptance, balance and harmony and collaboration. These really stand in stark contrast to American beliefs and values. I like uh, competition, individualism. The two pictures of the plants are traditional tribal stories that are available on the Cherokee Nation website. There's a culture link and they'll have stories come up. I actually got to hear some of these stories through my grandmother. And she's there in the middle. And I have a picture of her when she was nine months old, that little picture beside her. I love that picture. And I'm thinking that she probably got those stories from Grandma Brown, the picture of the woman on the chair with the pipe. Uh, because her own mother passed away when she was five years old um, from flu. She got the flu and passed. And so I can't help but I smile when I see see those pictures and see those stories and know where they came from and know that when I tell them my children how long those stories go back. So that has implications for how a person thinks of in terms of health, in terms of wellness. And so I wanted to highlight this part of it. And this is where sometimes I can lose people or you may want to get up and walk out of the room because you think, that woman is crazy. But I hope you'll hang in there with me as we go through this. Uh, native explanations of illness. Something is out of balance. Within yourself. Within your family. Within the world. So I can have a physical symptom. And so the explanations I have for that are not going to be just limited to myself. It's not just going to be limited within the individual or where I might be feeling that pain. I'm going to have my awareness up to say, what is this? There's an imbalance somewhere. Is it in my mind, my body, my feelings, my spirit? Because those can transcend systems. Something that arises in your physical as a physical symptom Maybe because you're not fulfilling the roles on a level of spirit, maintaining your obligations as a family member within your clan, within your tribe. <coughs> Contrast to the Western medicine, oh, okay, here's the symptom. We're going to trace it to the system in your body, and that's where we're going to treat it. So it's very different. And then in terms of treatment, that's holistic. Not that we don't see medical doctors. I know if I break a bone, I need to go to the doctor. Um, it might be later that I reflect on why did that happen? Was I distracted? Was I thinking about someone in pain? You know, the story can come after that. So I don't want to perpetuate a myth that we don't use hospitals or anything like that. So you can use both of those and go to a traditional healer to address all aspects of the person. And I don't want to leave this slide without emphasizing that there is extensive knowledge of herbal medicines. And so, this was some powerful stuff passed down over hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, in terms of what worked. There could be prayers, there could be ceremonies involving not just you, but the whole person. And so, hopefully you can get a sense that this way of being in the world transcends you as an individual. And this where it gets a little personal. Growing up in a family 
where I was very connected to my grandmother. Never got to see my father's family. My father was white, my mother was full blood. So my identity was steeped in interactions with my grandmother. And here's some of the things that I heard having that background that I've gone over on the previous slide. Most prominent was that I knew that my brother was born with like a second skin over the face. Some people call it a veil. Other cultures have this as well. Um, and we knew this meant that he would be a good medicine man. He always seemed to know things before they were going to happen. Often he would have dreams that wouldn't just be brushed off as your mind you know, running away with you. Um, they would be attended to. He would get physically ill when there were family hardships and pains. So he'd experience those things physically, violent illnesses, really awful. And we would go to see uh, the medicine man, and we'd take tobacco to be blessed or doctor. And then my dad, although he wasn't Cherokee, believed in those system, believed in that system, those values, and so he'd be the one that would smoke the tobacco, and we'd smudge ourselves with it. And then I also knew, never, don't ever talk about that outside of this family. People would think you're crazy. Some of you may be thinking that now, and that's okay. So I was protected, and I followed those rules until today, because again, I think that door is opening a little bit to have a sense more of an acceptance, and plus I have tenure, so. <laughs> but I did want to point out that it's not, you know, there's these sources of learning that connect to this way of being in American society. Um, it's referenced as post, well, the, the text that I found as I was wandering one summer in my doctoral program, I said, I'm taking the summer as a break. Got to. And wandered through the library and found this book. And it was related to a researcher, two researchers. I know one was affiliated with Harvard. And they used a Washington University completion test to study ego. And what they found um, with the sentence completion test, there was about 9% that these people don't fit. You know, they're not checking the box. They're kind of outside of the standard responses. And this is particularly striking. And so they went back and went further at this 9%, and that's how they formulated uh, part of their theory of transcendent development. And so I don't want to leave this slide until I give you a sense of what those people are like. And this is where I'll have to go back to my notes to find it. And I'm sure we've come across people that are in our lives that are like this, that don't fit the box. But they seem to really um, see an interconnectedness across themselves. They were known to make really good uh, activists, was another descriptor that they had for them. They just didn't fit the mold, and they didn't seem to care. But they saw greater connections in the world above and beyond themselves. And unfortunately, I can't go into more detail than that, but it really is fascinating. I always look for those points and places where there's connection across cultures, and this was one of them. So other things I knew about historical trauma, although we didn't call it that, it wasn't named, it wasn't connected to what my family was experiencing at the time, and it wasn't fully grieved. But my grandmother told me stories about the Trail of Tears, and she didn't spare anything. She told me about the death. She told me about being, uh, people were taken into stockades. So many people died. There was, you know, sexual violence even. And for her, that was a way to let me know that history, and also to be aware of the potential for it to happen again, for people to get that mean. She also put in stories in there of people that were allies, you know, that stood up like the, the men in Henry Fox Brown's story and didn't agree. <coughs> Oftentimes people don't believe me, so I like to use pictures and I like to use quotes um, from the actual source. This was a government appointed commissioner of Indian Affairs. Uh, it wasn't native. The government would appoint uh, non-native people to oversee the affairs on reservations. And so this is a quote. 
and again, connect to that story of Henry Box Brown and connect to an image of being in your home and having somebody knock on your door and say, give me that five-year-old. And of course, you're just, no, you're not going to take my kid. Yeah, we are. And you see they're gone. And they say, if you don't give me that kid, those rations that you depend on to eat, you're not going to get those rations. So not only that kid, but that elder you have there, the other children, and then you prove. And unfortunately, that's some of the things that happen. When you have a mindset and a vehemence that this is the way to save these people, we've got to make them white. So the best way to do that is to take those kids and separate them from that cultural context. And so I heard stories of boarding school from my mother. There are boarding schools in Oklahoma. My mother went to uh, Seneca Boarding School in Wyandotte. It didn't close until 1980. Uh, she went there uh, from the time she was in third grade to eighth grade. And I didn't find that out until fairly recently. Uh, but, and when I say recently, I mean last five, ten years. I knew she went, but I thought it was like a year, maybe. And the way she told the stories was just kind of a blank look on her face when I would ask. Well, did you get to see your brothers? Is a question I had. She goes, sometimes they'd give me a message. I'd get a message that they wanted to talk to me, so I'd go outside of the kitchen and talk to them. The boys worked in the dairy farm, she said. The girls worked in the kitchen and the laundry. My next question was, did you ever get to go home? Sometimes, if Grandma had money to send for us, <coughs> that was rare. And she's telling these stories, and you know, it feels like I've been punched in the stomach, thinking of not seeing, you know, my my children not seeing each other, not seeing me. And then here are some quotes as to why. This is from a book called They Call It Prairie Light, and that is about Shalako in Oklahoma. And the interesting thing is that this was a successful failure. I mean, the attempts to assimilate through the boarding schools. Because definitely some people, you know, lost trouble, <coughs> ties, lost language. But not everybody did. And one of the best quotes out of this book is a person that was interviewed that said, that's where I learned how to be Indian. Because in my family, we had lost the language. But at this school, I found other people that spoke my tribal language and we speak it in secret. The power of that, yeah. So that's why I call it a successful failure. And then I have a relative that has fond memories. There's still reunions from people that went to Shalako. So I don't want to paint a horrific picture completely. But you can't deny the policies and what they were designed to do. And so be open to those stories when you hear them. You know, go, oh, I'm so sorry. The weight for what people want to share with you about that. And be open to people will have some fond memories here. Because they still have friends. They may have met their partner there. But that speaks to resiliency. Oh, there's your baby picture again. <laughs> I also learned about trauma as a child and the impact of a parent that had trauma. And so this was um, part of my growing up. And for those who are familiar with the ACE, uh, Adverse Childhood Events, um, there's a couple of people in the department that I work with, and I'm like, we need to start a high ACE club. And the fact that we've remained resilient, despite all of these stressors and all of this trauma. So substance abuse in my father and my uncle, lots of death. And I was arguing with another researcher that wanted me it was asking me, why do I think that it was so bad in so many tribal communities? <laughs> so I was trying to relate historical trauma. And he, he just wasn't getting it. And he said something else that I was like, eh. And I said, here's the best way I can describe it. I said, too many times in our life, I'd be with my grandma and I'd have to stand on tiptoe still look into the coffin of a young, dead man. Lost so many, of, particularly men, you know, driving while they were drinking, Violent deaths, those types of things. Something about that comment to him at least made him pause and hopefully reflect a little bit more. And not that I have the corner, the, the corner on truth, 
but I truly felt like that's what I'm getting at, what it's like. There's physical abuse and there's also sexual abuse. And then this is the point that I turn to the diagnosis part. And I can't help it, a lot of connection and beauty in these stories as well. Um, my niece is on the top, and I ended up taking care of her, moved in with my brother, and took care of her from the time she was 13 months old till she was three and a half. Um, at the point that these things were happening, the sexual abuse, I had memory of everything but the sexual abuse. By taking care of her, memories started coming up. Being with her, her vulnerability, being so little, it just started to trigger things. And so, I got to see a counselor sporadically when I could afford to pay for it. And so I contacted her and let her know that these things had built until I, was diso I had a dissociative episode. And so I went in to see her and she took down some other symptoms. And um, she told me you have the book Courage to Heal. She said, I know you don't have a lot of money. You can't come back for therapy. Get that book and work through it. And if you can't afford both, because there's a book and a workbook, she said, get the workbook, because it has exercises. She said, the other thing, make sure you have somebody to back you up, because you're taking care of a kid. So if you start dissociating, you need somebody to call to help take care of that kid. And so I had those two things in place. Never had to call somebody to take care of my needs, but, and I owe a lot to her. She opened me up to all of that and put me further on that pathway to wellness and healing. But really, it really be an unsettling time because you're getting these memories coming back and you don't know, I, I couldn't even remember who the perpetrator was. I would find myself looking out of a window and being, and then going off is the way I can describe it, with the scene, with the smell, with the touch, seeing something, and then I would start dissociating. Also having intrusive memories at night, nightmares, that kind of thing. Um, but eventually, uh, I did remember who the perpetrator was. And folks, this is when the recovered memory debate was going full speed. And so I opted to do a paper on recovered memory. I mean, part of you wishes yeah, I'm making this up because it's, you know, horrible to go through. And so I did a paper on that, looked at the research related to it. Um, some of the researchers reporting, um, like if you're in a courtroom and you're asked to recall an accident. So not always the same type of trauma that's being referenced there. So that gets into some of the symptomology of the PTSD, and I'm not here to diagnose anybody. There's criteria for it. If I trigger anybody here today, you need to go get some help. Um, but I do want to talk about what it's like, and there's a way, way to get through it. 1998, um, I was at a turning point. I was so very shy. I hated speaking in public. Um, my older brother said, I don't have a sense of what it was like for you growing up. Because he was eight years older, he was male. He was pushed out working when he was 12 giving part of his income to the family. You know, boy, go out and do your thing. Where I was like, oh, you can't go outside. You know, it's not safe. When a lot of the, you know, trauma happened in the house. But, um, so I told him, I said, I carried so much shame. I said, when my mom told me to get the mail, I would peek out the curtain to make sure nobody was coming down the street. That nobody would see me as I opened that door and reached out to get that mail and pulled it in. And the look on his face was like, and part of that story got home to him what it was like. And so, in, I was at a crossroads. Do I go ahead with this doctor as I've been encouraged to do? Oh my God, I'm going to have to teach. I'm going to have to be people. I can't do that. And that really created a lot of stress, a lot of strain. And I noticed that I wasn't enjoying my son like I used to. The little blonde headed, the one in the middle of the drum. And um, so I went to the student counseling center at that point. And um, I got a diagnosis, second one, but a third one. Um, dysthymia, the mild, low grade chronic depression. 
you can still function, but it's just always there. With major depression layered over, and I got on medication. And I know a lot of people are against medication, but for me it's like, I'm watching the clock, and when it gets to be 7.15, I start making moves to, well, i got to put the kid to bed. That's not good. I'm not enjoying him. So I tried the medication and got the caution. Okay, four to six weeks until it's going to take an effect. It was like that next day. And I can only relate it to you. My body has never known serotonin. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I got a little serotonin. <laughs> and the most vivid memory is the indecisiveness was gone, associated with you know, worry. And, it, and so it was very, uh, very uh, transformative for me. Then, you know, so I'm doing okay. Uh, therapy, sporadically, in my doctorate program, dealing with all the stresses and the strains of being the first and like an Indian in the program. That was uh, so much associated with that, where I had to be in the role of an educator, when I really shouldn't have been. Um, explaining about history and that type of thing. People would get to start on their topic. I would have to pull out a history lesson first before I got to talk about it you know, depression and sexual abuse. And I was focusing on resiliency to child sexual abuse. And so going over the history of the trauma and the historical oppression, people didn't have a mindset for that back then. Then 2011, wow, you can say, ah, oh, because that's hope. 2011, she was, uh, when she was 15 months old, her dad passed away. I was up for 10 years. Depression, had another major depressive episode. Could not get my primary care to look at switching my medication. I knew the stress was overwhelming the medication. Finally, found a psychiatrist that was open to seeing me. And I bring that up not to show, show you I'm long suffering, but to highlight the gaps in our service systems. You know, couldn't get that medication changed. You know? Oh my goodness. So there's how it was all playing out. There's the diagnosis. Hopefully I gave you some of the symptoms associated with it. And now we're going to move into the other piece of this. So all these things, if I can go back. So all these things are operating in me as an individual. Between here, I got involved with that research project I talked about. Try not to fall asleep as you read over this. There's a lot of words up there. So it was a, a team that was across disciplines, uh, psychology, social work, different branches of psychology too, clinical, educational side. We, it was across universities and levels. We had graduate students, we had professors, assistant, associate. It was also cross-cultural. We had three Native Americans on that team. And I was like, wow, this has never happened to me before. Usually I'm the only one in the room. So this is pretty cool. And we interviewed adults that had attended boarding school. And I came out of the project late, so most of the other people interviewed. Did the interviewing. And I had to be careful and mindful of myself because this is what my mother had gone through. So I would have to take time after our team meetings about the research. Because uh, team people would, there'd be one-on-one -on -one interviews with adults. We'd attend a boarding school in Oklahoma. The person that did the interview would get someone to transcribe it. And they would print them out. And we would come together as a team to decide the themes. Stories that I will never forget from people were one woman talking about little black shoes. They were all issued little black shoes when they went to boarding school. Whistles. Whistle blows, you walk to the lunchroom. Whistle blows, you stand in front of your chair. Whistle blows, you sit down. Whistle blows, you pick up your spoon. Military, you know. Food and shelter, one person said there was not any food. There wasn't good shelter at home, and so actually I was glad to get to the boarding school because at least there was consistency with the food. Trauma, a lot of trauma. These people were talking about. Resiliency stories related to sports. Some people threw themselves into sports, and that's how they felt good. They were active. I took care of them. 
And so those are some good stories too. I guess I need to get closer. And one day, we were sitting around this table, and an interview came up that was very defining and represented a critical point and ethical dilemma for me. So it's an interview with a female, Native American. The interviewer was Native American. And she was telling the story about her experiences in boarding school. She started talking about how she's still connected to people she went to school with. And she said, you know, sometimes I get a sense um, when uh, one of the friends is going to be ill, something like that. She said, and then oftentimes, she said, I'll get a call that, yeah, indeed, this friend has been ill. Or in the worst case scenario, the friend has passed on. So I, you know, reading that first part we're going over, I'm like, for me, that's normal. That's part of being transpersonal, having this transcendent experience. It's not completely alien. I didn't think she was crazy. You know, I was pausing and waiting. What did, what I did wonder about was, why is she telling, telling anybody? You know, that's supposed to be protected. You're not supposed to tell anybody that those things happen. Because it'll be seen as crazy. And I thought, well, maybe because she was with a Native American interviewer, she felt that was okay. And that's where my mind is going. Did she really know these things are going to be shared, you know, outside of this one person? When she's doing this interview, um, it's in the notes, and the person that conducted the interview is there with us. And he goes, and then she stands up and starts looking around. She said, we were at a conference, and we were in a secluded area, and we got off to the side. And she goes, in fact, I kind of get that sense right now. And she stands up, and she starts kind of looking around. And then again, my thought was, mm, it can be normal. Why is she doing this in front of somebody? But then also I've read of this phenomenon of people pretending that they're more connected than they are, and they think it's cool, <laughs> and they can kind of embellish. And I'm like, maybe she's wanting to seem like she's really traditional or connected in front of this native interviewer. And so the team coding started. So all these thoughts are going in my head. Team coding starts. Everybody said she's got PTSD. Maybe they were thinking the thoughts were intrusive, uncontrollable, she's having flashbacks. Not quite sure. Oh, goodness. PTS. And there, in my mind, I'm going, that's not PTSD. I've had PTSD. That's not PTSD. It's possible to get a sense that something's going to happen to somebody else. I can't say that in this interview, in this room. There they am crazy. I'm not supposed to talk about it. That'll be portraying everything I've learned and everything I've heard. And then those other thoughts that I referenced before. And I'm like, definitely there's potential for trauma here. We know these folks as a group. We have a lot of trauma, violent victimization. American Indians have the highest rate in the country, ages 12 and up. I know this. I've done the research on this. She's been to boarding school. The potential for trauma is there as well. I mean, certainly there's a potential. And then, again, I can't say anything. Well, what if I don't? You're going to start coding PTSD among all these boarding school attendees when it may not be the case. And so all this is swimming, and there was an ally at the table. By ally, I mean she'd done a lot of work with Native communities. She was white. I call her scrappy. Scrappy little white woman. And she goes, did anyone ever consider that this woman was having a transpersonal experience? And I just went, oh. and then I went, what? <laughs> she opened the door for me to like let all this stuff out. I'm like, I don't think it is. But you don't really have, I mean, at that point, historical trauma, how do you distinguish between the two? Um, and we haven't even been layered over that part really yet. But, um, you know, from my experiences, and again, mine are not, I'm not saying she's not, she didn't have PTSD symptomology. Um, I don't diagnose, so don't take that as the end all final word. What I wanted to highlight is the dilemma that was here. And the cultural traditions of being in the world that said that this isn't crazy, these things happen. And so I offer this up. I found this, and I know there's a text, Association of Transpersonal Psychology. 
Um, I've been told not very highly esteemed because it relates to things like this. But again, making those points that within American society there are these there are these connections as well. Okay, you remember this slide? Where we talked about what's historical trauma. What I didn't put up there for you. Those are what we went over before. I didn't put this up there. So okay, historical trauma, unresolved grief. Well, Maria uh, Yellow Horse Braveheart talks about what happens is there's a constellation of features in reaction to this trauma. That runs the gamut. And so the question is, how do we even assess it? We're talking about symptoms that span a number of diagnosable disorders. And these questions arise, what distinguishes the historical trauma from the other disorders? So if this had been out and more prominent at the time of that research, that could have been another layer to it. Is it transpersonal, which can be seen as a cultural thing? Is it PTSD? Or if this work had been done, like I said, more prominent and accessible, is it historical trauma? And so how do we distinguish that historical piece from the present context of trauma? And as I said, we're a highly traumatized group in the present. Um, and also for veterans, there was a study done of Vietnam veterans and American Indians that had fought in Vietnam, had higher levels of PTSD than any other group. So what's, what, what's going on? Thankfully, um, I hate to say it, but people that critiqued Maria's work, um, it's a good thing. Because in the scale rose, um, Dr. Les Whitbeck developed a historical brief loss form. And then associated symptoms. So we have a way, and he's done a lot of work with this in terms of how it can tip people over, uh, how it's connected to depression, discrimination, and use in particular. And so there's been research related to this. And so he'll ask people, you can see it up there. And so he first did work with elders and parents, and I don't have a chance to go into more of the percentage of responses, but you know, this is based on qualitative work and then quantitative work. So, people think about these things. It's not something that happened in the distant past that doesn't impact them now. And particularly if you come from a communal culture, you think of that group. And you think about connections not just now, but in the past and in the future. And then here are the symptoms. What Dr. Whitmick found is that there'll be the sense of loss, and then there'll be uh, anger and avoidance as a factor, or there'll be a depressive kind of reaction. And so his work let us know that yes, it is a phenomenon. We're still in early stages of research about it. But thankfully, we've moved further along. And I want to see us move into a sense of more resiliency, how it can be associated with a sense of strength, because that's how I use it with my kids. I'll never forget one time that the, the one that's now 20, soon to be 21, was whining and complaining. And I said, I, I hear what you're saying. I'll give you about give you about 10 more minutes to complain about that. And I said, but you need to get yourself straight. I said, these people fought and died for you to be here today. And this is really a waste of your time. And it's true. To have a sense of what, you're never happy that these things happen, but to have a sense that we are still here, we still have knowledge, we still have language, we still have wisdom, after everything that has happened, to take that away. And so this is a very basic, rudimentary summary of what has been researched that I refer as release 
and balance. You know, storytelling, disclosure, there's been some research that's shown that it's been healing related to trauma. There is an Indian Country Child Trauma Center here in Oklahoma at the Health Sciences Center at OU. These would be a big foot. I know it's impressive work with trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. We'll do a training related to that, and then Dean will come in and also talk about the connections with tribal ways. One example she gave was the sweat lodge, and she said, what we are told is that you have to clear your mind of negativity and those kinds of thoughts before you participate. Connections of that with cognitive behavioral therapy. So she makes those links and those connections, and she has trainings ongoing all the time. I encourage you, if you want more intensive training, to look at some of it, to look at her website and see what is there. Um, Maria came up with a historical trauma and unresolved grief intervention, and it involves a lot of journaling, um, where basically you, you journal out your individual trauma and do a timeline for it and a graph, and then you connect that to the bigger uh, group level trauma. Different outcomes with men versus women. Um, the men actually had some more depression after undergoing that intervention. I wonder and think if maybe that's because um, we don't allow men to be able to connect to that pain. And so for them, it, on the pathway of healing, it's a process of realizing the depth of all of this and releasing their own pain, where the women had had more experience with releasing it. That's just my hypothesis. How does it improve? Uh, SAMHSA, Substance Use Mental Health Services Administration, sponsored a drumming group. Um, didn't have a chance. I'm a busy one. Got three kids. Didn't have a chance to look more into that, but I know that it's been funded as an intervention. Uh, meditation, so much more and more coming out. Neuroscience related to the changes, what takes place when meditation is an ongoing. And then art relating to that release. And then in terms of my individual life, you know, telling the story, utilizing traditional medicine, seeing a medicine man, uh, ceremonies that me and my children participate in, uh, meditation combining tobacco that's been blessed by a healer. Again, this is just an individual story to put a little bit of a picture on the other part that I'm showing. And we have to be very careful and very cautious because we're dealing with trauma. We don't want to put somebody back into that place and re-experiencing if we don't have resources for them there. Um, if we're not trained in trauma and how to deal with it, it's not the place to start asking for those stories from folks. It's the place to advocate for more funding for research and therapy and counselors that are trained. There is a post-traumatic growth inventory. It costs money. So I haven't been able to get that one yet. A colleague has it. I'm going to try and swipe it from her. I hope no one in this room actually wrote it. <laughs> I'm just going to get mad at me for doing that. But here's another way that I use children's book. This is actually from a book from Maya Angelou. I gave it to my students for the first time um, last semester. We have a really good group. I'm really impressed. These students give me hope. You know, we've got one woman in child welfare for 20 years. She doesn't want to go anywhere else. It takes a lot to do that. So be open to resilience and fostering post-traumatic growth. And at the point now where you come across people that there's nothing really that scares them. Life doesn't frighten me at all. That's how Maya Angelou finishes her book. And then I did find this quote from Pretty Shield, Medicine Woman of the Crows. She was a strong-hearted person and could heal her own wounds. Uh, not that you need to stand in anything alone, but after you've been through so much and you've gone along on the pathway of healing, there is a sense that nothing can really take you off balance. You know what you need to do for yourself to heal and to heal people around you. And then I had the chance to hear a traditional story uh, as told to Janelle Adair. And she said, seven generations after the Trail of Tears, there's going to be a a set time. It's going to be the time for a change. I refer to it as a transformation. Well, I'm sixth after, and my kids are seven. And putting that cultural story around it, she tells a story, and it's very empowering. It was very uplifting to me at that time because I don't want to get sugarcoated. It's it's hard, and at times I feel like I'm holding back so much water, and it feels impossible. 
But when she told the story, it put a framework around it. And if that's my role in this, to be sixth generation, that's okay. And after that story, I didn't have to pay $150 to go see my counselor. Culture is the cure, I've heard many people say. Last slide. It still can be a happy, beautiful life. Not that there's not struggle, but I don't sit around with my kids and tell trauma tales all day long. They know their history. They know the oppression. They know how difficult it is to talk about it, because when you talk about oppression and trauma, there has to be an oppressor. And so people are very resistant, resistant to looking at that history if they belong to a group that in the past has been an oppressor. These are just happy pictures. Yeah, I got to go to Vegas once. <laughs> How am I on top? No, I'm sorry. You did great. Thank you so much for staying today. Thank you.